Okay, we're live. As far as I can tell, uh, everything on my end is working. So uh, with us tonight is uh, Mark Garrison, former Chief Warrant Officer in the U.S. Army. He flew uh, helicopters UH, I'm gonna, UH-1 Hueys, the, I'm going to get this wrong, maybe the C models? Yeah, Charlie model. Uh, C models back in um, Vietnam. Uh, he wrote a book about it called Guts and Gunships, which um, I can't figure out. This is the first time we're actually doing this uh, this broadcast. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I haven't figured out how to get all the words down on the bottom of the, the screen here, but I'm going to link all that. His book is going to be linked on my website. Um, everything, basically, how you can uh, his, his bio and everything is going to be on there. Uh, Friday, I was home because uh, I got to work at like um, uh, 1230 on Friday. It's actually kind of nice. And uh, I was thinking last year after Memorial Day came and went, um, I wanted to uh, have a Memorial Day show, you know, and I do this show every two weeks and Memorial Day just kind of falls in between that time every week. So, uh, and right now we're kind of at the halfway point, but I wanted to do a quick show um, with a, a uh, fellow veteran to talk about uh, Memorial Day and, and really what it means to us and what it means, uh, what it means to him. Um, so with that, uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Garrison. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So, oh, absolutely. Um, so the first thing I want to bring up uh, with Memorial Day is, you know, I find that, and, and we talked about this in our previous uh, podcast, which if listeners want to find out more about Mark and, and really get into some good stories, we had some good stories going on. Uh, go to um, waitwithif.com and, and under the uh, previous episodes, you can actually go down and see uh, our podcast. We had a good, um, I want to say it was an hour and a half long, long discussion uh, on yeah, flying and, and everything Vietnam. Uh, it was really good. A lot of fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, what was the, uh, the thing I was going to bring up there? Oh, and actually when I was putting together my new uh, intro music, so I try to change, I, I'm just, you know, I'm learning this, I'm on, on our second year and I put the new intro music together and uh, I used a quote from you <laughs> on there. Oh, yeah. So you, yeah, so if you hear any of the new programs, uh, your voice is actually mixed into this uh, sort of trippy uh, new age sort of uh, intro. So it sounds pretty good. So Memorial Day, uh, to me, and I think uh, to a lot of veterans, uh, it, it's it's not so much a veterans holiday in that it's not for the, us that are, and this is my my opinion. I want to get your opinion on it. Not so much for us that are that made it, that are walking around, that are um, uh, uh, you know living our lives. To me, Memorial Day is for the folks. Um, that didn't actually make it. Uh, the ones that weren't able to uh, come home and, and, you know, have families and grow old and, and do all the stuff that, uh, God forbid, you know, we end up taking for granted. And my thoughts on that are, are, are uh, I don't mind when people, you know, thank me for being a, a, a veteran, especially on that day, that's fine. Um, but I want people to understand that it's not about me, and it, I would rather it, you know, not not be about me. When I go to events on Veteran or on Memorial Day, I try not to wear anything that shows I'm a veteran because I really, to me, it has a lot to do with with the folks that uh, that passed away. Uh, and what do you think? I agree with what you're saying. I but I would also throw in something that I think is important. I think there's a huge chasm or dichotomy in our society of who's looking at Memorial Day. I mean, is it the teenagers, at the 20-somethings or 30-somethings that have never seen combat or never been a better or never knew anybody that died in the war? You see them lined up at a grocery store on Memorial Day weekend throwing potato chips and beer and on the way to the beach, and it's a holiday for them. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think they completely don't get of what it's about. On the other hand, if you get a couple of veterans in that same line, let's say they identify themselves by their hats, one World War II and one in Vietnam, they instinctively understand what Memorial is about, just like what you just said. Especially the guys that have been in combat and have seen friends die. I saw, I, don't know, I, saw tw I didn't see it all of them up close, but I knew 24 pilots that died in Vietnam. And 
I can't get through Memorial Day without feeling quite somber. And I don't feel like partying. You know, yeah. so I think there's two groups. I think you're right that it is for those people that gave it all. And not the us that just gave some. But but the other I think there's a large part of society that's missing the boat on what it's all about. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I do see that. Um and part of me wants to be, uh, and maybe I used to be a little uh, uh, angry about that. You know, the folks that don't think about it, uh, the teenagers who go to the beach and play with their um, iPhones and not, you know, just think of it as a day off. But another part of me, and I guess it's the the more zen and peaceful part of me that, that is growing, uh, wants to uh, have them, or, or I want them to be able to do that. You know, I'm glad that kids aren't aren't dying anymore. Um, not to say that that uh, them for not appreciating Memorial Day is to wish that they would understand it on the level that you and I understand it more so. You, uh, especially with your war, um, but in the same sense, I'm I'm glad that they get to experience this life without the worries uh, that a lot of us uh, have had. Um, there's a T-shirt that's that's going around. Uh, the guys at Ranger Up. Uh, put out and actually it's the company that makes this shirt. They do a lot of um, veteran related shirts and they have one out that says uh, it says something along the 0.45 percent. Um, what's uh, amazing about the current wars and the current um, veterans coming th from that wars is that it, it is only 0.45 percent of the American population that has yeah. served or suffered through or had any sort of sacrifice whatsoever uh, through the, the global war on terrorism. I think, do you remember what the numbers are for your generation as far as folks that uh, that served? Um, I don't know, but I would have went in before the lottery and I was drafted. I had, I wasn't, I was gonna get drafted, so I enlisted for flight school. Yeah. And then the lottery came, but it was a lot more of a percentage. You had no choice. It wasn't, the, the volunteer army wasn't there yet. That's right, okay. And I agree with what you're saying with one caveat, and maybe an elaboration. I long for the day that these kids on the beach and everything else, where it will no longer be necessary to have a memorial day. Yeah. Because, you know, if, if mankind ever gets to the point where he realizes war is just not the answer, and evolved beyond that point yeah. and into more like what you said, more simple ways, you know. Yeah. But I think now that all of the people that have died in the war, I think there's been 630 or 640,000 American deaths since the, the revolution. And mm -hmm. another, another 1.2 non-combat, 1.2 million non-combat deaths, and I think 1.3 million um, this related to service, and so I mean, it seems you have to have some kind of remembrance of the principle what they fought for. A lot of these war, the early wars, especially, were important. The Revolution, World War II, to stop fascist fascism and all things like that. These later wars are getting pretty iffy, you know. You have to be pretty interventionist to to uh, to support them, in my opinion. <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's 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 right, and I understand that. Um, you know, uh, when you start when you start wondering, you know, why are we fighting? Are we fighting for oil? You know, what are we fighting for? Uh, that can cloud up that can cloud up everything, uh, especially yeah. when you're overseas. You know, you like yeah. to think that you're fighting for freedom. Um, and you know, it, 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 I guess at the end of the day, you have to consider it that you have to consider that everything you did was for um, bettering uh, your folks back home. If not, uh, your morale would drop. You you just wouldn't. I don't think you'd be able to to function. Uh, and what's funny, and I guess it's not funny, but uh, you know that that questioning of what we were there for happened. You know, in your war, uh, happened in my war. Um, yeah, I'm sure. It, and maybe, you know, maybe even World War I, it happened. Uh, uh, World War II seemed to be maybe the only war that we kind of, <laughs> we had a, an obvious uh, 
bad guy and we had an obvious uh, reason to be in it, you know, uh, for, for mankind's salvation, I guess. Well, yeah, that's, that's correct. And that's what I was trying to point out. The, the impetus behind the war is important about how, how historians treat it later and how societies treat the war later. It, historically, I think, Kevin, the, the veteran, for a short time after the war, in Vietnam, we didn't get any respect when we came back. We just got, it was horrible. The, the U.S. population blamed the war on the warrior. And we didn't want to be there. And uh, and then in the 80s, they tried to make a about face and uh, apologize for that. And now everybody that puts on a uniform is a hero. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. We, were, we were all pariahs. Well, of course, the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Right. And it takes history and time to sort all that out. I noted when, when you call me to do this, I... I read articles, and one, one was very interesting. You know who the largest uh, employer of veterans in the United States is? No, no idea. The U.S. Postal Service has like 230,000 veterans. And I got to think, maybe it shouldn't be PTSD, maybe it should be post office stress. <laughs> <laughs> Conti you, you continue on your, your, your government with that. <laughs> about what post for a while. But it's full of humor in it. Largest <laughs> employer of the veterans in the United States. And forty or to fifty percent are above sixty five now. But the veterans historically tended to be forgotten and left along the wayside. And they're trying to correct that now. Due only to a lot of political pressure and veterans groups and things like that. Right. As far as the Memorial Day, I think the, the dichotomy that I just mentioned is one of the most important things that if we could correct it, it would be really good if we could. There was a, if I could just tell you a couple, read just something very short about it. A prominent sure. American about what he said. Okay. In 1962, at his uh, <clears throat> at the West Point graduation in 1962. Okay. I'll, I'll say he was in a minute. But he said he, the guy's talking about his estimation of the American combat veteran or the American serviceman. Okay. He says my estimate of him was formed on the battlefields many, many years ago, and has never changed. I regarded him then, as I regard him now, as one of the world's noblest figures, not only as one of the finest military characters, but also as one of the most stainless. His, his name and fame are the birthright of every American citizen. In his youth and strength, his love and loyalty, he gave all that mortality can give. He needs no eulogy from me. Or from any other man. But when I think of his patience under adversity, of his courage under fire, and of his modesty and victory, I'm filled with an emotion of admiration I cannot put into words. He belongs to history as furnishing one of the greatest examples of successful patriotism. From one end of the world to the other, he has drained deep the chalice of courage. As I listened to those songs of the Glee Club and memories, I, I could see those staggering columns of the First World War bleeding or bending under soggy packs on those many a weary march from dripping dusk to drizzling dawn, slogging ankle deep through mire of shell pocked roads to form grimly for the attack, blue lit covered with sludge and mud, chilled by the wind and rain, driving home to their objective, and forbidding to the judgment seat of God. I do not know the dignity of their birth, but I do know the glory of their death. They died unquestioning, uncomplaining, with faith in their hearts and on their lips, the hope that we would go on to victory, always for them, 
duty, honor, and country. Always their blood and sweat and tears as they saw the way and the light. And 20 years after, on the other side of the globe, against the filth and dirty foxholes, the stench of ghostly trenches and the slime of dripping dugouts, these boiling suns of the relentless heat, those torrential rains of devastating storms, the loneliness and utter desolation of jungle trails, and the bitterness and long separation of those they loved and cherished, the deadly pestilence and drop of disease, the horrors and of stricken areas of war, their resolute and determined defense, their swift and sure attack, their indomitable purpose, their complete and decisive victory, always victory, always through the bloody haze of their last reverberating shot, the vision of gaunt, ghastly men, reverently following your password of duty, honor, and country. And that was the gentleman Douglas MacArthur. Oh, wow. I thought that was eloquently put. It was put. Uh, one of the, uh, I guess you could say, dichotomies of combat and the combat uh, veteran is uh, all this grief and all this misery uh, for those who survive tends to breed uh, very beautiful poetry and prose and, and paintings and, and, you know, uh, things like you just read there. Um, I have a yeah. question. Um, when you Average and and hopefully the people reviewing this, you know, I'm I'm assuming most of them are, are are you know your average citizen. Like I said, that the amount of veterans that there are today are, are fewer and fewer. But when you go to a uh, Memorial Day ceremony, or perhaps just a day you're walking to the post office, and a helicopter flies by, uh, to one person they can put it out of their mind. Uh, what type of impact does that have to you, uh, considering your background? I can't. I always look, look at it, find it, identify it, and wish I was flying it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the aviator in you. <laughs> yeah, it is. Except in time, when a bunch of people are shooting at me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's it's the meaning of things can change. Uh, yeah, whenever should. I see one. Think about Baghdad International Airport. My kids, I could be out with my wife, and and it's just one of those things where your 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 mind goes goes back, and and you know it doesn't always have to be negative, um, but it's a profound thing because if you think about, you know, I spent years in the in the military. I spent eight years in, in college and grad school. I spent, you know, uh, it, when you start adding up all these things that you spent time doing in your life. And then the actual short amount of that time that, that's spent in combat or in a combat situation, the profound impact it can have on the veteran or, or in the, uh, uh, you know, it just, it's a very personal thing and you find yourself revisiting it um, even when people don't realize you're revisiting it, whether it's in dreams or whether it's, you know, you're at the grocery store and you see something that reminds you. Well, you do. And I think, I have a theory about that. It's, let's call it uh, why well, Einstein was right about relativity. <laughs> yeah. well, every time I got into really a bad situation in the helicopter of Vietnam, I was convinced I was going to die. Everything just went, the clock stopped. It just went into slow motion. And because I think what happens is that there's so much of a sensory overload more often than more than you ever get in normal seconds and normal living that it interprets time differently. I mean, if you're getting a hundred stimuli for every one that you normally get, I mean, time's going to seem like it's yeah. slowed down, to compact, partial. That's what happens. And, and, uh, in reference to what you were saying, then that takes on more of an impact in your life because it was so damned intense, you know. And yeah. that's what happened to me, anyway. Have you have you ever read or um, even heard Carl Sagan's discussion on the pale blue dot? Oh yeah. So what happened? 
Oh yeah, he had a book, that's right. And what happened was back in, uh, I want to say it was 1990, actually he came up with the idea maybe uh, right after, so what Voyager 1 did is it went to, to Saturn and it, it did, and then it, it was leaving, heading towards exploration. It was leaving um, uh, our solar system. And Carl idea that said, hey, let's turn the cameras around and take a picture of the Earth. It, it means nothing. Uh, we're not going to get anything scientific out of it. We may, you know, we may break the, the you know, million dollar machine doing this, but I think it's going to be important, uh, or that will be a very important picture. And I'm surprised it's not as uh, a common or, or, or taught thing to children in school or, or even as adults. But what it was is it, it turned back and you see this, um, what looks like a, uh, dust in a beam of sunlight and he uses that uh, analogy when he discusses it and yeah. he talks about where we are alone in the middle vastness of, of nothing right and how you know how many emperors and how many people have spilled blood and have died and have killed each other and uh, you know to to conquer or to um, pull over a small pixel of that dot and he contemplates a lot during that that whole discussion about um, you know the meaning. Why do we do that? Why aren't we more kumbaya and holding hands? Which is you know obviously an idealistic way to think about complicated than that. But when you break it down to its core message, it does make a lot of sense. Why is well, it? Why is it that you think you know under these extraordinary circumstances of of being on this rock hurling through space? that we, we continuously find different ways to kill each other. I think uh, we're talking about two different things. I think you know, we're almost talking quantum and classical, almost, except quantum, of course, is subatomic, micro world, and classical physics is a macro world. But what I was getting at, though, is that what, you made me think I'm crazy. This is why I look at it. I look at the brain as a limiter, not an enabler. Because we've only got five senses. And the only way we can see reality is through taste, touch, sight, feel, smell, and hear. That's the only thing. There's radio waves and everything else going through here, and you can't tell a damn thing about it. And the, they've proven now. There's a book I'm reading right now called Brian Greene's The Hidden Reality. He wrote to The Eloquent Universe. He was a Nobel Prize finalist in physics. But anyway, the, we're, we were, through those five senses, the evolution took us down a path of most likely to survive in this terrarium right on this planet and that's what it concentrates on just survival on this land or water mass if you happen to be a water land creature and the rest of it though is just kind of lost so there's tribalism because that's a survival of groups and their culture and they have, they have instincts to have to their career group to survive because territorialism, there's fear of the other, and uh, all because of evolutionary processes that have gone on for a long, long time. And these other, it's going to take a long, long time again and more to get rid of the stuff you're talking about. And I think we have to get rid of it, or we're not going to get through the great filter, and we'll probably wipe ourselves out like many other civilizations through the cosmos is done. My opinion, I can't prove that. <laughs> yeah. Well it seems like we're 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 heading that way, especially with what we see, the madness we see with ISIS, uh, the madness we see with um, you know countries like Iran who are trying to build the bomb. I mean ideally and and it's it's an unfortunate thing to go back, you know, to to um, comparing this with Memorial Day, but, you know, I have a photograph of uh, my great, I don't know, I think it's three or four, probably four greats, great, 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 great grandfather who was in the, the Civil War um, in the Navy, and then it uh, goes to my, you know, great, great grandfather and great grandfather, they all were in the Navy, and they all had their, their wars, uh, you know, all the way up to my father, 
who was um, in during the 60s, uh, Vietnam War. And then we're growing up and, and you know, when you're a kid and you start learning about war, I asked him, would I ever have to go to one? And he said, no, there's, there won't be any war anymore. There's no reason uh, for it. And then, you know, sure enough, the day <laughs> happened where I was, I, I was walking in Baghdad. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, and now, and, and you're, you're, um, he is on children uh, and now that I have a child I want more than ever for this whole idea of war to, to be over and for us not to have to face that again because I don't want my son to have to to have to do that well of course but you know you think as long as mankind has been on the earth he's butchered one another yeah you know, we have we butchered one another brutally and uh, through political because of political reasons, you know, power, status, money, sex, all those things that float to the top. And uh, we're going to have to get to a point. To, have you ever heard of the great filter and whether there's life in the end of the other life in this uh, solar system, or not solar system, but in the galaxy? Uh, are you talking about like the, the Fermi paradox? No, the Fermi paradox is by Enrico Fermi, the Italian physicist, he said that, I'm glad you're aware of that because this kind of ties in, but he said, where is everybody? I mean, if they're out yeah. there, where is everybody? Well, the point is, have you heard of the Drake equation? No, Just no. Just a little bit away from the memorial today. But, but anyway, the Drake equation was written by Frank Drake in 1960. Well, I believe he's still alive. He's got an, ep they've got an episode about it for now on Netflix now. But anyway, he he wrote this equation, the number of star formations there are in the galaxy average per year. And then he put how many of those are probably at planets? How many of those are probably in the green zone or the liquid water zone? And he used real conservative numbers. I mean, like, it's just almost impossible for to have any of them. And he, he still came up with, I don't know how many million in this galaxy alone. But my argument is this. If, if you, the, every society has to get through a great filter. And that great filter may be, well, no one knows what it is. It depends on what planet you're on. But, it may be going from prokaryocyte to eukaryocyte. And that may be it. Maybe most uh, life forms don't do that. Maybe they can't make that hurdle. So they don't, they don't uh, discover F equals MA or anything else. And uh, but if they get, then if they do get beyond that, though, they've got to stop from their, their aggression that we've been talking about here to one another has to solve itself before we have the capability to destroy ourselves. And we have both now. So aggression, horrible aggression, and the capability to bull this planet into a bunch of planets. And that's what scared me. I mean, the clock's kind of running out. <laughs> hmm. um, <clears throat> what is... Uh can we can start thinking about wrapping it up? But what what do you, what do you do when uh, Memorial Day? What do you do in the morning? What do you do? Is it a day like any other for you, or um, do you go to cookouts? Do you what what do you do for for Memorial Day? I used to I used to be guilty of the when I came back as a young man from Vietnam. I really didn't realize what had happened to me. I didn't realize the long term effects it would have. How could I? I was twenty two. Yeah. And uh, so I joined the grocery crowd throwing paper, potato chips, and beer in the cooler and going to the beach. But it yeah. wasn't very long that I saw, wait a minute, this isn't right. And I said, yeah, generally now, it's a, it's a solemn occasion for me. And um, I'll go out and go through cemeteries sometimes. And uh, just remember the guys that died. Remember their faces and their smiles and their laughs. And 
and wishes they landed and hope there's no more. And I think that's what moral is all about, like you said initially. It's for those guys that didn't have the chance to come back and have a family, you know, or grandchildren or anything else like we have. That's, that's right. That's what and, it's about. Uh, you know, and I, and I think we talked about this on our podcast, our initial podcast together, uh, at the aging uh, Vietnam veterans, you know, they're, they're, it's now our grandfather's war versus our father's yeah. war. And I look around and I see, uh, uh, to uh, express this, I'm not sure if I can, <laughs> I sometimes think things and I can't get them out uh, verbally, so it ends up sounding like mush, but <laughs> uh, I, when I see my father or when I see you or I see anybody who is of that generation and they have their children and their grandchildren, you can almost think, just by luck in some cases, in another situation, that person might not be here and someone else would be here. So you're talking lives, you know, one life gets killed or, or ends in 1966. There's a whole uh, web of lives that are, that are, are lives, lives that are lost as a result. Right. You know, there are, and other things that's why there we're... are no, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, it broke up there a second. There, there's, um, it's similar to chaos theory in mathematics. I mean, like a butterfly watch, it flaps its wings in South America, and a hurricane on the East Coast occurs a month later because it creates a simulation and a little cloud forms and angles, this, that, and the other, and it builds into this huge storm. If the butterfly never taken off, it wouldn't happen. Sure. But that's what you're talking yeah. about here. One life. People don't think that's very astute of you to think of that because it's it seems like such an, an insignificant thing, especially with seven billion people on it. But it's not. I mean let's take my life. If I had died, I would never have married Lynn. I wouldn't have had four children, and several grandchildren. And it, it goes on from there. It does. They, none of these people would have existed. And uh, they're doing really good things. One's in, in, in medicine, and the other's a software engineer with his own company, and one's a writer. And they're just, and that would never have happened if, if that one bullet had come that much closer to me, you know. Yeah. That, a lot of people don't think of that, about the ramifications of seemingly insignificant events. But they're not. Yeah. That's what string theory is going on, the membrane theory, the, the natural physics. <laughs> I love reading about this. Yeah. I understand it. You know, uh, Richard Feynman, the natural physicist, he was, uh, somebody told me he understood uh, quantum mechanics, and Feynman was one of the greatest physicists in the world. He said, uh, I would suggest that if you think you understand quantum mechanics, that you haven't looked at it long enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> I want to get, and, and keep in mind, uh, I do have the explicit uh, uh, tag on this, so you're allowed to swear. What are your thoughts, and maybe you haven't heard about it, but uh, today, uh, maybe it was this weekend, uh, someone had defaced the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, the wall. They had spray painted on it. Um, and then they destroyed something else that was right near it. It, uh, it, it, can I say what I really feel? Yeah, absolutely. It really pisses me the fuck off. Yeah, as it should. Because, I mean, what, what the hell? I mean... They didn't have their face in the dirt or there was a bullet wound in the head. I mean, what? I got to know that when I came back. I didn't start that war with either of those guys. And I don't understand people like that who will do that. But that's not the way to protest anything anyway. It's to to go through channels and policy and and try to make the politicians understand what the hell is going on. Not to deface a memorial for people who paid the ultimate price. That's, That's right. Just, and there, there's a 
a disconnect there that is there's no way it, it's a it's a formidable wall there's no way to um experience combat or experience the camaraderie you have in the military oh, yeah. uh, without actually being there so you have these these idiots that told WikiLeaks that came out and this kind of reminds me of the same thing this whole WikiLeaks uh, it was a uh, helicopter gunship and they were taking out a group of guys with uh, AK-47s two uh, photographers with them and they were slinging their their um, uh, telephoto lenses over their shoulder and when you're looking through the the forward-looking infrared system they looked like and, and whatever and so he leaks put the some um, attack helicopter killing uh, you know a journalist uh, completely on accident completely uh, collateral uh, the words that people wrote about these helicopter pilots calling the murderers, calling it a collateral murder and everything. It's it's a complete disconnect from the actual situation that occurred. Um, they were marking, they were making comments about how uh, individuals could, you know, they dehumanized the enemy saying, hey, we roasted those guys or whatever terms they used and stuff. And they say, this is awful. This is barbaric. This is, uh, and, and, you know, this is a common thing. judge, uh, people in the military for their actions because they just there's no way for them to understand why things happen or why we react or act the way we do yeah um, now to look at it from the veteran standpoint is these guys were doing their job they have to dehumanize the enemy it's it's part of it if you every time you pull the trigger on someone if you think about their mommy or their daddy or their you know you get really that deep into it you're going to go insane and and you're not going to be an effective soldier so the way they talk and they communicate and yeah it, it, war is ugly it's horrible collateral damage occurs there's no such thing as a completely perfect septic or not septic uh, antiseptic um uh, shot on someone. I mean, there's always, it's a terrible thing. And the blame should not be on the veteran who is making, or on the or the uh, military personnel who's making that decision under uh, the, you know, the blame should be shifted on, you know, the, maybe the politicians or whatever, why we're there in the first place. That's right. But, yeah, violence, violence takes, takes something inside you that uh, I don't expect anyone to understand. And then, and the reason why I went off on that is because I think you're seeing the same thing with this defacement of the, of the wall weekend. They, they may, the, the, whoever was making that test uh, has concept of, of the military person is like, at least the, the, the combat veteran is part in a massive com or massive cog massive machine that goes all the way back to you know uh, everything we find ourselves involved in now you can look back 50 60 75 years I mean it, it's you yeah. know back to the chaos theory yeah. I don't know that's that's my thoughts on that and well, and, well that's a good point Kevin you know the and another thing that's that easy pointed out is that that combat veteran has to make that decision instantaneously if you hesitate, many times you die. You, that was the way it was as a pilot over there. And as a gunship pilot, many times the enemy was so close to who we were supporting. You had them, they wouldn't pop smoke and they were whispering in the radios because they're afraid to get their position away. And I'd tell them, you have to pop smoke. I can't fire. I might kill you guys. And sometimes it would be like 20 feet away. So you'd have to come in, and you got 17-pound HE warheads, it's more than 105 howitzer. And that's, there's a lot of stress in that, shooting that close to friendlies. And sure. You know, yeah, I mean, it really is, and that's why a lot of guys couldn't fly guns. And um, so, you, and you have to make the decision instantaneously. Those who hesitate or panic just die. It's simple as that. And that's not an easy position to be in. I didn't ask to be in it, really. And the guys that generally criticize us, or I don't think they would have done as good a job as I did. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I, I read a quote that said, um, 
there's men who absolutely oppose and they're protected by those who are comfortable with it or something along those lines. And it's true. Yeah. Ever a way to um, be, so, you know, we have situations like that where we try to help the uh, citizenry understand and to remember those who for, for what they have. Do you think uh, there's ever a way to get, get these people to understand what we go through or uh, is it just the cross we bear as being, you know, veterans and right. we just hope that this allows people to qualify? The short answer is no. I don't think you can ever get a non-combat veteran to understand what a combat veteran goes to simply because of one big fact out there. And that's, it's an esoteric experience. You have to do it to understand it. But you can vicariously have you understand it, maybe in a book, read about it. But that's so much less intense. The way I like to put it is like this, to try to get people an understanding. I personally got shot at all the time. And got shot up all the time. And it's really amazing that I lived through it. But I ask people to try to explain that. I tell people, let's say that you were going out to get your mail one day. And you've never been in the military or anything, but you went and you went out on your porch and you reached for your mailbox and all of a sudden somebody jumped up out of the bushes across the street and emptied an AK clip at you. And they barely missed you. A couple of them went through your sleeves. Knocked the glass out of the door and now you fell back in the house. Now that lasted three seconds. And that's the only time it ever happened to you. But I guarantee you that, people, that person would have PTSD. Oh, sure, yeah. And that's one three-second blast of what we did for for the army and i got a letter from the sergeant major of the army two or three years ago and he's trying to explain why so many vietnam veterans had so many problems and this is a guy in washington you know the top enlisted man and he said he said it was either 10 days a year of combat or 10 days for the four years the world war ii veterans saw actual combat the rest of the time is bivouacking, occupying, marching, all that. Now that's an average. They're already out there. Right. And then he went to the infantrymen in Vietnam and in the field all the time. As opposed to 10 days a year or 10 days for four years, I can't remember what it was. The infantrymen averaged 237 days of hot contact every one year. There's not much of a comparison, is there? In 10 to 237. And the helicopter pilots even saw worse than that. It was more than 300 days a year. So that's a lot of stress to be thrown on a guy, you know, in a year's period. Can't get much time off. <laughs> sure is. Um, and I guess to is, you know, and I don't know if we talked about this on, on our original podcast, but what is the most um, profound impact uh, being a, a combat veteran, um, you know, serving your, your country in Vietnam had on your life? It made me realize how incredibly brutal a man can be to his fellow man. I mean, that was a real awakening to me. There seems to be no limit. And uh, it, that stuck with me. And it's made me not cynical at first, but hopeful now. But we can somehow change that. Because I look back at medieval times, and there were 
everybody's behind everybody, man. Now we just got a great you know, but, but that was one of the most profound things to me. I could not believe how brutal people, just murderous people would be. You know, even when they were on the combat field, they would, they would be. And it was a change in other ways, too. But, you, know, you, you went from boyhood to manhood in a hurry. Guarantee. Yeah, yeah. What is the most optimistic? What is your most optimistic view about, uh, I guess, the human race? Um, you know, be that, okay. yes, maybe, you know, who knows? Well, you, in other words, what I would hope would happen. You mean what I would hope would happen or what I think is possible? I couldn't hear you. Uh oh, I can't. I can't hear you. We kind of lost you a little bit there. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Can you? Yeah. Okay, I think for virtu a virtual miracle to happen, and for the defense budget on all nations to drop to zero, and everybody goes into the space program as one unified species, and goes and sees what's out there and works as a team. I think that would be a great, great outcome for this this life form on this planet. And uh, it really would. <laughs> you know, another thing about that Drake equation, if you think about it, is what I tell skeptics: the, the sheer numbers have me convinced that there's a lot of life out there, but they have to exist now, not in the future, and they can't be extinct. But even if there's only one in the Milky Way, which is us, and 200 billion stars, there's like a trillion galaxies they know of. That would be, a, if there's only one per galaxy, Kevin, that's a trillion life forms. Yeah. yeah. So that, that seems to me like an extremely conservative estimate. Do you know what an ELERG is? Neelur is an extremely luminous infrared galaxy, and they found one with a large array of the infrared imaging from this the, in South America. And I may get this wrong, but the number is so incredibly ridiculous; it wouldn't make any difference. Is the stars involved estimate that this the number of stars in this galaxy is twelve billion light years out? Is either 300 trillion or 3,000 trillion, one or the other, in one galaxy. <laughs> wow. You'd think there'd wow. be a few worms crawling around somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <crazy. laughs> I think, I think my, my, my thoughts are that if if everybody just put their phones down and just went outside and, and oh, contemplated the fact that we are stuck on this rock hurling through nothing hurling through nothingness that lasts infinity you know in to infinity flying through space with everything zipping around as comets um you know that that's the extraterrestrial stuff not to mention everything that's going on here on our planet 95 percent of the ocean we don't know what's there uh the we know uh, less about the ocean than we do the solar system that's right that's right and if we all just went out and said holy shit look at Look at where we are. You know, we were born, we were brought up, we were raised, we were kind of lulled into this this uh, existence that we have, and it's this, it's it's always there. But people want to uh, bide their time with their phones or movies or whatever. But if you go outside, you want action, you want drama, you want science. Uh, well, something that looks like science fiction. Just go look up in the outer space. <laughs> And then it puts it puts all our differences aside. We're just a bunch of hairless monkeys running around this earth, finding different ways to kill each other. And in the end, can't get us anything. Even Caesar. Let's take someone like Caesar, who who ruled for I don't remember how many years, but um, even he. And we're talking about him to this day as one man. In in compared to the vast existence of this uni universe. It means nothing because eventually this earth won't be here and it, it doesn't matter. So, and that maybe we'd be able to get along. I don't know. 
Well, you know, I can talk all night about this stuff. But, but you know, entanglement, quantum entanglement, the, what that means is that they know from the Big Bang for the first 300,000 years that it was still a soupy, intensely hot environment. That everything was entangled. I mean, every particle was was attached to another in some way. Mm -hmm. And they just proved the other day at MIT, I think, they took an electron and took it to one coast, they took another electron in a pair, it's, it's sister out of the atom or something, took it to the other coast. And then they spun one electron and the other one instantaneously did an equal and opposite reaction. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's quantum uh, entanglement. Sure. Yeah, yeah, and you know that that brings. I didn't read anything about this yet, but I'm gonna try to find out. That that brought to my mind something. Maybe space and time is an illusion. Maybe there is no such thing as space and time. I mean, how? Yeah, it's possible. How did they come? How did that happen? If it was space and and string theory and membrane theory is. It's starting to elucidate several concepts about these things. The entanglement is still here. It's never really, nothing's ever really detached itself. That every, everything is a part of a whole. And that also means consciousness. Which the quantumists say now that consciousness, consciousness seems to be, uh, I'm not getting conditioned religious on here because I'm not. I'm way, I, I'm not going to offend you, but. I'm not at all, but anyway, right. the um, consciousness appears to be the fabric that holds the universe together, is what the mathematics is pointing to, like this is a big, like a software program or something, like this is a big computer, who knows, because we only got five senses, we can't see almost any of us, <laughs> you know, dark, yeah. you know, right? and dark matter. And instead of, uh, you know, collectively getting together and uh, appreciating this, the, yeah. you know, these amazing yeah. facts, we decide to, you know, yeah, shoot at each other. Yeah. 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 I can't. Yeah. I can't. Yeah. 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 Believe the it, the dogma of it is just beyond me. I I read once that uh, it was a list of I I don't know what it was comparing. It might have been um, the atheist versus the the Christian, and it had a list of all, all the gods rejects, and it was a long list. You know list was there except missing one which was Yahweh and I, I thought that was kind of uh, an interesting way to look at things <laughs> <clears throat> well you know it, people don't think that Islam and, and Yahweh share scripture and they're both Abrahamic religions mm -hmm. yeah they are yeah that's right they're not violent the Old Testament the Christianity is violent and so is uh, the Quran the yeah, article what you say read it it's violent <laughs> And uh, <laughs> the, yeah, there's stories. I've, I've read the Bible several times to try to understand it. And then I started realizing it was. I wanted to understand why it was written and who wrote it and why they wrote it and the population that wrote it. That's the only way to look at it. Because there's yeah. some really wild stories in it that don't line up with our social structure at all. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Well, Mr. Garrison, I'd like to start uh, uh, wrapping this up. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Um, we got to have you on again. Uh, this was, and this is the way it works. Whenever there's someone interesting, I, I say, "Hey, let's have a little 20-minute conversation." You know, have a little, and then an hour later, we're still talking, and we could go on till the uh, uh, the sun comes up. Um, and but you know what? What are we talking about? I, I have your email. Yeah. Why don't we talk about uh, something 
interesting and controversial. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. What I'm going to do is I have your email, so I'm going to I'm going to uh, email you several questions. Some of my thoughts. Uh, it's fun, um, and then I'll have you on, and we'll talk about something completely not combat related. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Plus, plus, we're both uh, scientists. We're both uh, uh, medical practitioners, so we'll uh, to talk about the the worst thing that you can do though is get two aviators together, uh, and then usually we just go off and talk about it, uh, aircraft. But <laughs> that's we'll, we'll try to stay away from that one too. Yeah, well, you know, this guy, can I can I finish with one one minute story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was at the airport yesterday. My brother bought a. Uh, uh, seven AC or Uncle Champ, no electrical system. Are you familiar with them? No, <laughs> no electrical system. He had to prop it, and uh, okay, he let me fly front seat, and he was in back and command seat's front seat. I just love it. This grassroots flying. And then I was at the airport, and they came back in, shot some touch and goes, just power off and power on stalls and some seat turns, things like that. Came back in, and there was this guy at the airport. Named Phil Collins, and he was a case 80 years old, but he looks like he's about 60. And he's a retired uh, Frontier and Southwest captain. And we had to talk him about, he was just really an interesting guy. I just loved the guy. And he was telling all these stories about flying. He's got, my brother's got 22,000 hours. As a, that's a lot of hours. And Phil, yeah, that is a lot of hours. Phil Collins has got more than that. But, but <laughs> anyway, he said he was flying with this, he used to fly with this guy that he'd sit over here and read the Zane Gray novels. And <laughs> 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 it got dark, he had this flashlight. <laughs> and he wouldn't pay attention to anything. He just looked at Phil and so he said, one time they were going to Kansas to, to pass Goodman, they were going to Wichita, I think. And uh, he called Goodman and said, we're in the area, and Goodman said, I wouldn't land here if I were you. Everything's blown away. <laughs> and he said, okay, we went on the bridge to uh, Wichita, I think it was. And this guy was reading the same gray. And lighting was just all over the sky. And it was just light like day. And so he finally looked up like this and squinted out the windshield. You know. So you want me to fly? And he said, no. And so he just went back to the gray. When he landed, he said, nailed it. Made a perfect three-point landing in a C-97. I don't know if you're familiar with that. And, uh, no, not anymore. Did it too. A three-point landing. And he said, oh, he was really proud of it. So back, and all of a sudden, the damn thing made a right turn. And was right facing him was a whole bunch of trees. Oh, no. <laughs> and this guy looked up, threw his Zane Gray novel down. Pulled the prop on the left engine, fell into the jam, full throttle on the right. <laughs> Spun it around. <laughs> and he said, oh, damn it, Phil, fly the same to the box, would you? The <laughs> 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 way well, you told it was really funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was just un unshakable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we used to, my, my initial, um, uh, uh, Instructor pilot, uh, he used to fly us out to, or we would fly out cross country to these little grass strips in the middle of Texas. He'd go to all the Vietnam pilot, and we we realized that he would go there and then go into the little uh, pilots lounge and just chat with all the other pilots. Uh, and me and my my fellow student would sit there twiddling our thumbs, waiting for <laughs> wait for him to come back with the airplane. Because you get, I'm telling you, you get two aviators together, and it's uh, anyone around. It's it's just it's bad news because you're. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. All right, Mr. Garrison, always a pleasure. Uh, thank you for sharing your time with me tonight. Well, you're certainly welcome, Kevin. Anytime you talk, let me know. All right, I will. I'll keep in touch. Okay. I'm, right, rather, take I'm rather eclectic. No, talk about it. Okay. All right. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks.